Welcome everybody to our second study on Joseph, led by our brother David Richards. We're looking forward in great anticipation to that. And uh, welcome to all the brothers and sisters on Zoom. Lovely to have you with us. And also a special welcome to Rachel, sister Karen, uh, who's uh, Zoomed in for the first time. Uh, thank you for joining us, Karen. Lovely to have you with us. Um, we're going to commence uh, with a word of prayer. Um, for the sake of convenience, I shall, I shall give the prayer. And then we'll hand it straight over to Dave uh, to continue our study in Joseph. All right, well, I'm just going to uh, hand straight over to Brother Dave as he continues his study on Joseph. Thanks, Dave. Thanks so much, James. Thank you for James and Janet and their family for having us here tonight. Welcome, everyone. My dear brothers and sisters, young people, all those on Zoom, lovely to have you. Is Maggie joined? Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, if I look like I'm an exceptional behaviour tonight, it's because my big sister is joining from Adelaide as well tonight. <laughs> so uh, welcome to Maggie if she did manage to join as well. Um, so welcome to our second study as Joseph, uh, Joseph, Jamin has indicated our second night together. Um, we got a little bit to get through, of course, uh, as we as we progress. So uh, we're going to launch straight into what we're looking at tonight. Everyone see that okay? If you can't, join the Zoom link and you will be able to see it a little better. Um, so tonight we're going to look at this. The next chapter and a new beginning. Uh, the Lord was with Joseph, point two. Refusing temptation, point three. Uh, interpreting dreams in prison, point four. Interpreting dreams out of prison, point five, and lastly, elevated to rule in Egypt. So that's quite an in-depth summary, uh, given that we have a lot to move through tonight, um, and given that we have three evenings and we've already done one already. What did we see from our last class? Joseph accepted and understood God's plan. And that's one thing in, in the focus of our discussions uh, as we move through either last class, this class, or... God willing, our uh, third class as well. Hebrews 11. What was Joseph noted for predominantly out of that book of faith? By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bone. And so out of all the wonderful examples of um, Joseph's life that we come to consider, and it's uh, an enormous amount of um, chapters in the book of Genesis really devoted to the, the life of Joseph and the, the surrounding detail of his family. This is what Hebrews 11 saw fit. One, to name Joseph. That's an amazing thing in itself. So it's a great thing to study. And secondly, what was it? Well, it wasn't his patience necessarily, although he was fantastic. It wasn't necessarily his tenacious character or uh, his perseverance or his ability to to withstand trials that were massive in his life. What really made note here in Hebrews, as we saw from our last class, was the instructions he gave concerning his bones. So out of that, we take this theme of Joseph in a way, that God, uh, sorry, that Joseph understood and accepted God's plan. He wasn't focused necessarily on the here and now or what had gone or what was into the future. He was present in everything he did but most importantly, he looked forward to the future, the hope, hope necessarily for the children of Israel, but also hope for his life. And why would it be concerning his bones? Well, of course, bones, when they're brought to life again, brings forth resurrection, brings forth hope. And he knew the promises to Abraham, his great grandfather. He knew the promises to Isaac, his grandfather. He knew the promises to Jacob, his own father. He understood them well. And his, the patriarchs, the fathers of the Israelites, knew them well. They knew that there was hope coming and that their seed would encompass the whole of the earth. So that's what Joseph was looking forward to, no matter what happened in his life. So last class, we looked at his parents, the devotion of Jacob, particularly to Joseph. We understood that he was favoured in a way that he had a relationship that was very special to his father because Joseph was one that found favour in the sight of men and in the sight of God. He was a dreamer. We saw the dream of Joseph's. He was despised because of it. He was plotted against to be killed because of it. And 
we left off our last class that he was sold into slavery. Not a very pleasant experience for Joseph, of course. So let's commence then on our first point for tonight. The next chapter, a new beginning. Well, I'd like you to turn your Bibles if you would, and I apologise we haven't done a reading at all. I'll be fine. Um, but we can turn to the passage now. It's just that we uh, want to move through fairly quickly. But not only that, you do know the story, I would presume, fairly well. Um, given that we're studying it all year, either at NCYC and or some of the um, classes that we've already conducted outside of these ones. So the story of Joseph, I'm going to presume and assume that you know reasonably well. However, I do invite and I welcome either input, questions and comments as we move forward. That would be wonderful too. Genesis 39, we take up the record in verse 1. Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. So this is where we pick up the passage tonight of the next chapter, a new beginning for Joseph in his life. Well, this no doubt would in our minds bring about one thing, and that is the thought of change. This is what was happening in Joseph's life right here and now. And you'll see on the comments there, who loves change? Anyone love change? Who loves change? Well, for the sake of those on Zoom, oh, we've got one taker, my lovely wife. What are you going to change about me? <laughs> she already has done. <laughs> She's a, a, a work is done. A Complete. Sorry? A lifetime work. A lifetime, yeah, sure. Well, most people keep their hands down. And I think that's reasonable. I think that's fair. Most people would face change in their lives with a little bit of fear, a little bit of trepidation, uh, very uncomfortable perhaps. What a save. Not quite. <laughs> we need a tower. Um, cha change can be very, very challenging. And for the change in Joseph's life, if we can imagine his life prior to being sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites and then being dragged with iron around his neck, probably in cuffs as well and probably around his feet with a number of other slaves perhaps and or cattle and or anything else that the Ishmaelites had as their caravan as they travelled on their way to Egypt, what a most uncomfortable change that would have been. And you can imagine Joseph's heart. You know what it's like if you go for a job interview or you turn up somewhere for work at a different place or... Uh, I don't know what dentist. it may be. Going to the dentist. Nobody likes change at the dentist. And uh, bomb's toothless. Um, what about this then? I noticed, and actually Wayne Wilshire on Sunday pointed this out to me again, even though I've noticed it for myself on some respects. I think we had the, the, we had the younger and the older as, as two different groups in the seating. At our hall, and particularly it's more noticeable at the Dora Creek Hall, for instance, it's an empty hall when we get there. We put all the chairs out. So it's not like anyone has been allocated in a space at that point. But normally, <laughs> traditionally, we all sit in the very same spots in the same rows of the same area of the same little hall. We are creatures of habit. Even though we may not necessarily admit to it, we prefer not to change in our life. Our houses. I would do anything not to have to shift again or to sell a house and shift. <laughs> as soon as I pack the first box, I think, well, what are we doing this for? I'm not a, not a fan of it. Holidays, for, well, I speak for our family. Uh, we tend to <laughs> go south or we tend to go north. And if we're overseas, then it's usually east. <laughs> so um, we, we tend to be creatures of habit. And my point in the illustration of this is what Joseph had a very unchangeable life and unremarkable life up until now in many ways. They lived in the land of Canaan. He knew how to get to Shechem. He knew then how to go on to Dotham because a certain man pointed him in that direction to find his brethren. But outside of that, they were strangers and sojourners, living in their tents, feeding their flock, living in their own little country, in their own little world. And that's what Joseph came out of to head to Egypt. Imagine the fear. Imagine the trepidation. Imagine how that could change one's life for better 
or for worse, even more so. How would we cope? Put ourselves in that situation. And tonight, what I want to illustrate more than anything else, as much as the spiritual, what we can take away practically for our lives today. And I think that's part of the devotion of so many chapters of Joseph's life in Genesis for us to take away. What do we get from it? What do we take out of it? What does the reader that God has seen patiently um, persevering down through the ages to present to us tonight, what can we take away from it? What's Joseph's life mean to us? Well, as part of that, how to cope with change under trial. A question for you as part of working through this together, what is the most constant thing in mortal life apart from death? Suffering. Dazza said suffering. I agree with that. Yep. Taxes. Taxes is another one. Change. Ah, very good. I'm not necessarily saying that was the right answer or the wrong answer, but it's the answer I had. So when I hear it, then I'll hit the button. <laughs> Change. Pretty much constant, isn't it, in life, apart from the other things that we've mentioned. You can guarantee that no matter how normal our life is, no matter how structured we might maintain it, God, if not ourselves, will implement change almost on a daily basis, if not a monthly, if not a yearly, whatever it may be in regularity. And we need to be prepared for it. So... From America to Australia, from east to west, from north to south, what I try to do is accumulate off the internet what the top psychologists from all over the globe would summarise to how to best cope with change in our life. We're looking at Joseph. He's adapting to change. He is undergoing a massive change in his life at the age of 17. To so all the 17-year-olds or thereabouts, give or take 50 or 60 years, we're all included, right? We've all either been there or getting there. <laughs> so we're all a part of Joseph and we all will experience and embrace this at some point or another. How we cope with it, how we react to it, what we do with it, how we trust in God is what makes and breaks us. So this is what the top psychologists of the world will tell us. And this is just a summary in four main points. Here's what they say. This is how you can embrace change or adapt with it. Help others. Embrace new opportunities. Maintain relationships. Accept rather than resist. So in looking at that, what I've tried to do is bring in where would they have got those points from? Why would they adapt them? Why would they say they're the top Four points in summary of all the psychology in the world available. Why would they say that? Well, because it was already written for them and we've got it in front of us, 66 books, and we just need to tap into it. We just need to understand it. Have a look at our first example, if you will, helping others. Paul on the shipwreck, Acts 27, 33. For the sake of time and also for those on Zoom, I'll read it for you. Uh, Acts 27, 33 says this. <clears throat> This is Paul. They're on the shipwreck. They're about to die. And he says, and while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, this day is the 14th day that you've tarried and continue fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you, take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair, from the, uh, not a hair fall, fall from the head of any of you. And this is what this means to all of us. When change comes about in our life, more often than not, our natural instinct is to balk at it. We don't want anything to do with it. We just want our normal, regular life, right? But when we are faced with it, one of the greatest things that we can do in our life is to forget ourselves, is to get out and help others. And we're going to have a look at another example of that as we move forward on this. And this is what Joseph did as he maintained his life and persevered in Egypt. Next point, embracing new opportunities. Well, we've selected, and uh, Bomb Alaska helped me with all these, so as much as they are the points up here from me, they're really from us. Mary, Luke chapter 1, verse 26, when she was chosen by the angel, well, the angel was the messenger chosen by God to deliver the message that you are to bear the saviour 
of the world. Now, we're looking at Joseph's life, of course, and it's going down into Egypt. We think, oh, woe is him. And so it is. But on the other hand, here's a challenge that's presented to Mary, and you think, wow, how can I cope with that? Well, she embraced it. She took it on board. She said, I am the handmaid of the Lord, be it so according unto me. And away she went in her life, male, female, brother and sister, away they go. Maintaining new relationships, or main, sorry, maintaining relationships. What about this one? Daniel and his three friends, um, not unlike the story of Joseph in many ways, taken away into captivity, sold as slaves, so to speak, like Joseph, but they stuck at it together. You know, if I was put in a position like those or like Joseph, I couldn't ask to have better company than the closest friends that we have here around us today. What more could you ask for? Those of like precious faith that when you're feeling a little down, when you're feeling a little despondent, when you're feeling a little challenged, who's there to pick you up? The person that God puts in closest in your life to maintain a relationship, value it, make sure you're there for them and make sure we are there for them as well. Accept rather than resist. Well, Noah had been living a life for 500 years when all of a sudden God said to him, you know what? The total world that you live in and everything you've become comfortable with and everything that you know, I'm going to destroy. It's, I've repented myself of the fact that I've created mankind upon the earth and we know the story well of Noah. What does he do? He understands. He dedicates his life in acceptance to building an ark and saving what God, deemed seen, what God deemed fit to survive and, and to um, replenish the earth with. And so coming back to Joseph's life, the Lord was with Joseph as he headed down into Egypt. Now, if we find that, we pick up the passage back in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 2. Any questions or comments? All right, let's move on. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the, the Egyptian. <clears throat> so have a look at this. Here's a theme of Joseph's life, and this is all I want to point out really in this passage or this particular second point. Genesis 39, verse 3, the Lord was with him. Genesis 39, verse 3, again, the Lord gave him success. Genesis 39, 5, the Lord blessed the household. Genesis 39, 5, again, the blessing of the Lord was on everything. What's the reoccurring theme, folks? The Lord. The Lord. Very observant. Thank you so much for that. Lively audience tonight, I must say. Um, how amazing is this? The Lord was with Joseph. What else is it saying? He's being blessed, even though he's in a huge trial the whole way through. Very good. He's with God. Why was the Lord with Joseph, may I ask? What's the obvious opposite of this statement? Because Joseph was seeking God. No question. Is Lord Jesus or God? Sorry, say that again. Is Lord, the Lord you're talking about, is that Jesus or God? God, yep. Okay, the Lord, thank you. Yep, was God, yep. So um, <clears throat> here we have, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with him. The, the Lord gave him success. The Lord blessed the household. The blessing of the Lord was on everything. And in turn, Joseph trusted in God. Joseph was with the Lord. Joseph acknowledged that the success he had was from the Lord. Joseph realized that the household that he was put in charge of was blessed because the Lord was with him. And he understood that everything within that house then was blessed by God. How amazing. What's the lesson for us? How do we ensure the Lord can be with us? This is our day. This is our time. I would love you to come across to um, Proverbs chapter 3 if you would. I think you know this passage fairly well for those who have um, um, relied on the Proverbs for a, a number of things in their lives, perhaps. 
or at least um, studied it in some way or another. Um, for those who don't know, and I'd love to share it with you, Proverbs 3 and verse, um, <clears throat> verse 5 is probably my favourite verse in the whole of Scripture. But um, what I'd love to read is, is verse 1 to 7, but what I want you to think about as we're reading through this is think about Joseph through this and can you see Joseph, Joseph's life in this? So here we go. Proverbs chapter 3, my son, forget not my law. Let thine heart keep my commandments. Length of days, long life, peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the tables of thine heart. So shalt thou find favour and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So if that doesn't encapsulate Joseph's life, either at an early stage of his life or through the middle of his life or through the end of his life, I don't know what would. And, of course, it's not just Joseph, is it? Proverbs chapter 3 and, and verse 1 to 7 as, as the only example that we could take away. We could name nearly most of the examples of all of Scripture from Genesis through to Revelation that were counted blessed or favoured or faithful from Hebrews chapter 11 we had on the screen earlier. That's what people did to find favour both in the sight of God and man. Who else, who else found favour in the sight of God and men? Jesus. Jesus did. Yep. It says of Jesus, he found favour both in the sight of God and men. And so it was of Joseph as well. So how do we ensure the Lord is with us? Well, we acknowledge him in all of our ways to begin with. There's the first step. Acknowledging God in all of our ways and he will direct our path. Now, what would you say is all of our ways? Well, I don't think there's a definition you could necessarily pinpoint. It may be from the smallest of things in your life that you may choose to think about to the largest of things in life that you make decisions on. And you know that for your own personal lives, what they are. The scripture doesn't define what small or great is. It just says all. So if we want to show God and we want him to favour us, we need to acknowledge him in all of our ways. This was the courageous example of Joseph. From the day he was born through to the day of his death, he acknowledged his God in all of his ways. He looked to the future of God's plan and purpose. Joshua 1 verse 9 also on our screen. Have not I commanded you, be strong, be courageous. Don't be frightened, don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Perhaps Joshua had in mind, or Moses at least, uh, the words of or the life of Joseph in this particular instance as well. Well, we come to the temptation of Joseph in a way, um, whether or not it was a temptation or it was certainly um, a challenge that he would have had to face in his life. And we know this story reasonably well. Come back to Genesis chapter 39, if you will, please. <clears throat> Genesis 39. Uh, and the record indicates for us verses um, around about verses 6 to 21. Uh, of the challenge that Joseph faced from Potiphar's wife. Now, remember, he was sold into the household of Potiphar. Potiphar bought him as a slave to govern his house. Well, he turned out to do that anyway. Um, and, and Potiphar's wife took a fancy to Joseph. He, it said of his complexion, he was a very handsome and upright young man. Reminds you of Jamin a little bit, doesn't it? Just look at Jamin, there's Joseph. Um, so... Verse 6 to 21 gives the, the record of what actually happened there. We're not going to go into the detail of it. I think you know it very well. In fact, I think the young people are going to study it in a little more detail on Friday night. Um, but here's a couple of points that I'd love to illustrate as being what I see as relevant or important out of all of these um, particular challenge or temptation for Joseph particularly and what we can get out of it for ourselves. Um, Joseph says to Potiphar's wife in verse 9 particularly, if you've got your passage open there, it says, there is none greater in this uh, house, says Joseph, than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? 
Now, of course, he could have said, how could I sin against Potiphar? How could I sin against the laws of the Egyptian land? How could I sin against the moral nature that we all possess as humans? But Joseph, and this is clearly defined of his character, Joseph sought God. And to do this wicked thing, to lie with Potiphar's wife, as she would so desperately appear from the scripture to want to do with Joseph, was abhorrent not only to Joseph, but abhorrent to God. And that's what Joseph acknowledged. What a marvellous example, what a great lesson that we can turn to in Joseph's life. Quite often, we can feel very wronged in our own life, can't we, about situations that have occurred in our own life. In fact, we can even take offence. But truly, when it comes down to what's black and white, what's right and wrong, God has ordained laws. He has set in motion the principles of life and his commandments. It's really against God, isn't it? If somebody sins against us, really, they're sinning against God. We are his children, and that's something we need to acknowledge. Look at this other point here we've uh, got on the slide for us. This is what Joseph did. He refused, he left, and he ran. It's fairly specific, isn't it, in its, in its um, descriptive language of what Joseph did in this particular example. He refused, he left, he ran. In other words, he didn't sort of, oh, this is a bit of a grey area, what should I do here? Give me some time, I'll think about it and come back to you. That wasn't what he said. He didn't sort of hang around the house and make the temptation either worse for him or her and kept about his, his daily business, he left. <laughs> and at what speed did he leave? Well, the scripture's fairly eloquent. He ran. He was out of there. And what's the lesson for us? Well, when we're faced with similar temptations, whether it be in this situation of Joseph and Potiphar, or whatever the trial or the temptation is that we know defined by scripture is wrong, whatever it be. Here's the principle. We should refuse it. We should leave it alone. And if necessary, run away from it as fast as we can. And that's not always easy to do. And I acknowledge that firstly for myself, then for all of us. And as a scriptural example, we know full well of many examples that are considered faithful, even defined in Hebrews 11 as faithful who suffered the consequences of not being able to refuse necessarily on time or at the best of times or didn't leave at the right time or didn't flee away from it straight away. What is the most important things then we can do to avoid temptation? Well, from America to Australia, from north to south, from east to west, I'm able to summarise and communicate this to you from the top psychologists of the world and in four Main points, this is what they say. Situation selection, situation modification, detraction, distraction, and reappraisal. What does that mean to us in normal speak? Situation selection. Come across to Genesis chapter, or come back, I should say, if you will, to Genesis chapter 13. Here's a classic example of, of uh, what uh, situation selection could mean to us. This is uh, the story of Abraham and Lot. You probably know it quite well they were faced with a situation where the land they were living in at the particular time was not able to bear all of their uh, cattle and their livestock and their men and women and families etc so in genesis 13 verse 12 abraham chose to dwell in the land of canaan and lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards sodom but the men of sodom were wicked and sinners before the lord exceedingly so this is what the world around us tells us from a psychology perspective, if you like, about how we avoid temptation. Situation selection is this. Don't go there. If you know of something that is challenging to you particularly, not necessarily to everybody, but might be just to you personally, just don't go there. That's the first thing you can do. Situation selection. That's not always easy to do. You may be in a group, you may be in a company, you may have found yourself placed in a situation that you weren't even aware of and you were ignorant of at the time. So situation modification then would come into play. Now, we're not going to turn up all these passages. I don't think time really permits us tonight to do that. But 1 Corinthians 8 verse 13 
if you want to note it down, is the example of Paul to the Corinthians where there was particular people um, had an issue with uh, meat being offered to idols and then purchasing in the market and then offering it to their household to eat. And Paul could well understand that the temptation for many who could not get over the fact that it had been offered to an idol first and eaten. So Paul says, in this situation, I'm going to modify my behaviour. It's not that I'm going to be a vegetarian strictly for the rest of my life in this instance, but for men who can't live with that as an example and uh, are weak in that situation, I won't eat the meat in front of them or I won't eat the meat at all. I just won't do it. However, in other company who don't have any issues with it, I will, no problems. And so that's another situation that may help us in our own temptations, our own trials, our own um, challenges in life. Here's a lovely one I'd love us to turn up because I think it speaks so eloquently of a perfect example, which is Jesus, of course, in distraction. Um, did Jesus need to be distracted? The answer is no. But did he choose to distract his mind onto something that was of more loftier than the thoughts that he had in his mind at the time, perhaps, of can I go through with all this? Father, will you allow this cup to pass from me, so to speak? This is what he did. Matthew 26 and verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane. He said unto the disciples, sit you here while I go and pray yonder. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Now, this, um, this actual rendition in the Greek, well, the English doesn't give the best rendition of the Greek, but this was a heavy, heavy challenge for Jesus right now. This was life and death, literally. This was the distraction for Jesus. You know how we took a look at our previous example slides where we said, surround ourselves with good company, do things for others. This is the magnificent example of Jesus. He was about to do something for the whole world, as we well know. And he just asked for the distraction of his disciples just to be with him. Just come, just come with me. Just come with me. Pray with me. Watch me pray. And the best they could offer is to get as close as they could to him fall asleep. But Jesus was intent on going through this for us. He had the examples of Joseph before him and so many other faithful men and women that were able to overcome the challenges in their life. They refused it. They chose not to be associated with it. They even ran away from it as fast as they could. Jesus probably felt those emotions going through his body, and yet he chose by distraction to go through and to pray. And needless to say, in any of these four points here, from a psychology perspective, number one associated with everything of this that surrounds it is God. Never, ever let us lose sight of that because that's what Joseph's example is for us. And reappraisal. Sometimes we just need to reappraise where we sit, where we're at, what we're doing. Is our life really so important about what we're doing right now? Is it really getting me in the best way to the kingdom to uh, meet our God's desires to fill his earth with his glory. So one of the best things that we can do, I believe, in that respect, in a reappraisal is if our time is being consumed by, and I'll speak for myself, right, our computers, our internet, our um, hobbies, our sports, our fixing cars up, um, whatever it may be, right, <laughs> um, try replacing it or reappraising with things that are important. Daily readings or daily regular reading of the intake of God's word is fantastic. You can't be. And as much as it might be, Brother David Poxon said he'd rather dig a six foot hole than sit down at his Bible and study. I remember distinctly him selling that. <laughs> When he got into it, and I know it's true for all of us, when we do it, we thrill. We thrill in the, in the example and the wonder of God's word. Well, we move on to interpreting dreams in prison. 
we know the dreams fairly well as stories. I'm not going to pretend to try and make anything of them. I don't necessarily think there are too much in it apart from what they tell us, right? They had two dreams, the cup bearer and the baker, they dreamed. More importantly to us out of those dreams, what was Joseph's demeanor? Well, we've got to remember where Joseph had come from. Remember, he was down in Egypt almost in a way because of his own dreams, if we recall. Remember, his brethren said, ah, here comes the dreamer. Let's do away with him. So Joseph, in his mind, is saying, well, I haven't really seen any fulfillment of the dreams that I know must come to pass at some point in my life, but tell me yours anyway. So we have challenged our own life. We're not even sure how they might work out. We might be in the very middle of them. What's Joseph's demeanor in that situation? Tell me, what can I do to help you? What an amazing example. And I love this about Joseph. Genesis chapter 40 and verse 8. I'll turn back there. There's no need for you to. It's on the screen anyway. But Genesis chapter 40 and verse 8. <clears throat> this is what he says to uh, the cupbearer and the baker. They said unto him, we've dreamed a dream and there is no interpreter of it. And Jesus said unto, sorry, Joseph said unto them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. What's the theme we're seeing in all of the responses either of Joseph or the summary of his life so far or the depiction of his actions? God, God, Lord, Lord, God, God, Lord, Lord. It goes on and on and on. And in this particular application, when he's challenged, he could have made anything up, of course. He could have even chosen to ignore them. He made, a, he made any point he liked. But his first course of action was, no matter where he was and what he did was, the Lord either was with him or God was given the glory that he would give the interpretation. It wasn't Joseph. It wasn't anyone else around him. It wasn't how clever he was. It wasn't how brainy he was. It was the interpretation belongs to God. It's interesting how that last bit actually starts. Like he notices after they dream the dream, he actually notices that they, um, they look troubled, their faces look troubled. And it's not like they didn't approach him and say, Hey, mate, what's going on? Um, I've got this dream. You seem like you might know what this means. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't start with that. Joseph initiates that first contact. Mm -hmm. He notices that they're, they're troubled. Then he asks the, the guards, like, what's wrong with these people? And then he goes and speaks to them, and that's when they tell him. And it's interesting that Joseph initiates that first before they... And, and why would you even offer um, to interpret these dreams knowing where all the other dreams that he's had had got him in trouble. Like, he might have, he might have had PTSD <laughs> at that point in time about dreams. Oh, dreams that, you know, that, that made me in prison. Got thrown in a pit and I got sold, now I'm in prison. What have dreams got? Where have dreams got? Exactly right. A lovely point, Rube. Yep. Um, hopefully you heard that on Zoom. If you didn't, um, Ruben was suggesting how wonderful Joseph was in his example uh, dreams so far in his life had got him nowhere but prison and hardship and challenges, and yet he was the first one to approach the butler and the, uh, the, the baker um, to ask them why their demeanour was so sad and, and uh, the dream, of course, and then he would offer an interpretation that God would give and what faithfulness that Joseph had. Thanks, Rube. Excellent comment. Well, <clears throat> we often think to ourselves, well, let me rephrase that. I often think to myself, if only we had a vision ourselves. If only. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if somebody came to us like an angel that came to Mary that we looked at as an example? And there's other examples. Wouldn't it be amazing? Well, in so many ways we have. In so many ways. Here's a few examples and you know them well. Here's a vision that God gave at the very start. Genesis 3.15. It shall bruise It shall bruise, yep, the head and the heel, right? We know the expression really well. The vision was of God that Jesus would come about upon the face of the earth. That was the vision. He's answered it. He's provided it. He came. We've looked at his, his near death in the Garden of Gethsemane even tonight. We know he was resurrected and he's sitting at the right hand of God. Well, there's a vision. There's the interpretation. And we're blessed to understand it. Isaiah 43, 
It was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Who was that talking of? JB. Yep. John the Baptist. No question. Isaiah 43. Any Bible scholar, no matter where you are throughout the world, no matter what dominion of religion you possess, will all say the same thing. It's John the Baptist. Who are we to argue? Ezekiel 37. Valley of dry bones. Again, no questions of what it might mean. What was the valley of dry bones from Ezekiel 37 as God's vision that's been interpreted to us in these last days, so to speak? Whole house of Israel, the valley of dry bones. And if it were applicable or appropriate, I'd show you the bones of 6 million Jews that it took to bring that nation back to in 1948 to the possession of the land in which they were to possess that God said in Ezekiel 37, you will possess. That was his vision. Here's the interpretation. Now go and live with it. Move on. Do what you need to do in your life to believe in me. Ezekiel 38, forming of a north power. The north power from where? Where is north from? Nation of Israel, right? Anything that's applicable to God is applicable to Israel. From the north, there would be a forming of a north power. <laughs> we see that in our very eyes as we speak today. It's forming as we see. Revelation, probably, I don't know, as a percentage, 60, 70, 80% of revelation has come to pass as a, fort as a, as a vision from God with the interpretation thereof. We are just waiting for the last bit to be done. So we do have visions. We have the interpretations. God is asking us, what are we doing with them in our life? Interpreting dreams out of prison. This was Joseph as well, wasn't it? He was in prison interpreting it, and now he's of the opportunity to interpret them out. Have a look at this. Genesis 41 and, and verse 1, if you're there. It came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed and behold, he stood by the river. So here's Joseph, as Reuben quite rightly pointed out, why, why would he want to talk about dreams anymore in his life? They've only got him slaved and in prison. And not only that, it's two years. And not only two years, the scripture makes a point of how long those two years were. They were two full years. You can imagine Joseph saying to the but listen, don't forget when you get to so Pharaoh, just make a mention of me, will you? I'm sort of reading between the lines here or sub-phrasing, but that's what Joseph was after. And anyone in his position would have asked the same, I'm sure. But it was two years before, was it the butler or the baker? I can't remember. Remember Joseph because of Pharaoh's butler. Thank you, butler. Um, about that, that, that. Uh, two full years. So... Joseph is called or commanded, if you like, to come out of prison. He washes, he shaves, presents himself well to Pharaoh because Pharaoh in turn now has had a dream. So Joseph's life is full of visions and dreams till this point in time, isn't it? And he's yet to see how that might affect his own life really. Although he may well have deduced God was bringing him to this moment of time that he would share with his brothers later, which we'll see in our last class together, that God had set all this up in place so that I might be the sucker and the protector of you. And again, here's Joseph's words, Genesis chapter 41 and verse 16. Come across the page if you've got a Bible like mine. Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So it's a theme, isn't it? A reoccurring theme, a reciprocal theme. God, God, God. God is my life. God is part of my life. God gives everything in my life and God will give the interpretation as he sees fit to the prayer, to the prayer, to the, uh, the dream uh, that you've had. And uh, that dream was um, twofold, if you like, in the fact that it was to be uh, doubly sure I think Joseph's words were from those dreams. And we're not going to go into the detail of the dream. Again, there's nothing necessarily significant in its spiritual intake, I don't believe, from the, the, the wording of the dreams. We know them full well. There would be seven years of famine first and then seven years of plenty. And, and Joseph gave that uh, interpretation via God. Well, 
There you go. I haven't thrown one of these up for a little bit, but uh, that's just to tease your eyes. Now, can anyone pick out the one ear of corn that's not moving? It's quite a prize if you can get it. Pharaoh's ear. Nice one, Johnny. I like it. Thank you very much. That was corny, said somebody at the back. Any others? Come on, Paul. Surely you got something. There's more than one ear. Here, here. The answer is I just made that one up, but thank you so much for your input. Here's one. See that? Uh, who would like to be a volunteer to work on this next slide for us? Eli, right? Come on, sit up. You, you need all the concentration you've got on this one. So, for this next slide that we're going to put up, are you ready? Yes. I want you to read what the colors are. Read what they are. Read out aloud what they are. Yes. Okay, from top to bottom. You ready? Read the words. Read what the color is. <laughs> tell us what. Colors. Tell us what the color is. You ready? From top to bottom. Right away, you go. Red, blue, green, yellow. <laughs> Very good. Anyone else want to go? Yeah. Are you ready? Uh, go. Red, blue, yeah, green, yellow, green. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not hard, is it? But you do have to think a little bit as you're saying it. And the only reason I have this slide up, really, one is to give you a little bit of a break from my voice, but also interpretation is everything when it comes to scripture and we know particularly because there's so many denominations of religion around perhaps and that may be perhaps a little by interpretation or it could be ego or it could be a number of things right but at the end of the day it is really important that we understand the vision that god has given us the vision that joseph understood and it was accounted to him for faithfulness in righteousness that god's plan and purpose with the earth was interpret what i want to do with this earth and that is to fill it with my glory my glory is my character and i want to preserve as many as i can that want to be there in that time to be just like my character joseph was a marvelous example of that i've thrilled as i've continued to study him in depth which are only scratching the surface in summary as we present our classes tonight and forthcoming so we come to our last point for our evening for tonight. Elevated to rule Egypt. What a transition in Joseph's life from being a humble servant shepherd under Jacob's flock and care down to a slave in Egypt and all of a sudden elevated. Genesis chapter 41 and verse 38 to 41 reads this for us. <clears throat> uh, and Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such an one as this a man uh, in whom the spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none, excuse me, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house and according unto thy word and, and all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, see, I have set thee before I've set thee over all the land of Egypt. It's, it's like a, a fairy tale come to life, isn't it? Like it it's, it's hard to imagine even when you read it for the 50th time perhaps in your life, depending on how old you are and how exaggerated you might tell the story. But it's incredible. But I, could, I just can't get my head around this, how God works in not a Joseph's life, but in our life. And so here's the last slide that we want to consider to, to ourselves tonight. Are we ready to be elevated? Because traditionally as humans in many ways, or maybe it's just the way I am, traditionally we look at life and challenges and temptations and trials and everything else like we considered at the very start of our evening, who likes change, we consider it to be a negative aspect. And yet how many who have gone through the product or the produce of what it brings forth in change in our life can say, well, I can look back and definitely say I'm the better person for it. Are we ready to change our lives? Are we ready to continually change? Are we ready to continually mould our characters as God develops us? So from America to Australia, 
and from north to south and from east to west. We have accumulated the top three things that our psychologists of the world as professors and doctors that they are would discern for us of how we should act upon elevation. Here they are, reflect upon your strengths and challenges. Well, Joseph certainly was able to do that. 41 verse 33, he was discerning and wise and he let Pharaoh know that that's the person that should rule the land. He says in verse 33, now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, set him over the land of Egypt. So reflect upon our own strengths, reflect upon our own challenges. We need to be wise. We need to be discreet. We need to be acting that we are participants, if not sojourners, in the land of the kingdom already. God has promised us the kingdom. It's really how we react to that promise is whether or not we are in or out. Point two, understand your new responsibilities. Well, Joseph was able to advise Pharaoh in this, in verse 33. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out that man, discreet and wise. And in verse 40, Pharaoh says to him, well, I've sorted out and I've made my decision. And here it is, thou shalt be over my house and according unto my word and to all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Not only Joseph was able to give the, the, um, the meaning of the interpretation of that dream, it was one thing to do that, but he was also able with the wisdom of God and perhaps the interpretation thereof to point Pharaoh, the greatest man upon the face of the earth, arguably at that time, and tell him how to do it. Are we in a position to do that? Are we wise and discreet? Are we looking for new responsibilities or do we shirk change in our life to the point that we would rather put our head to a pillow or in the sand and let life uh, react around us without doing anything about it? Joseph was one of those people that no matter where he was, where he went and what he did, he found favour, he found grace, and in general terms, he was put in charge of everything that he was done, that he was doing, whether it be Potiphar's house, whether it be the jail house, and now the whole land of Egypt. And here's the third point that our doctor psychologists would recommend. Set priorities for your new role. So Pharaoh says in 34 and 36, let Pharaoh do this and let him, oh, sorry, this is Joseph saying this, let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years and let them gather all the food of those good years and that food shall be for food to the to, uh, store to the land against the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt. Joseph had a plan right from the start. He knew what was going on. He recommended it to Pharaoh and Pharaoh said, right, well, you're the man for the job. Are we ready for elevation? God has promised to us that life isn't rosy. In fact, even of his son, he said, Though he I might have started off wrong. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Sorry. Even Jesus in his perfect state is a set of him that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So God has not promised us that life is rosy, that we wouldn't necessarily not have to go down to Egypt, that we wouldn't necessarily be enslaved in a land we don't like, that we wouldn't necessarily be serving masters that we don't want to serve and taken from our families and our lives and our, and our precious things that are all around us sometimes that disrupt everything in our life, so to speak, because God wants to mould and shape and character us to the very best and characterise us to the very best that we can be. We don't know quite how that might affect us in our life. But what one thing we do know is that if we are trusting in God, if we're acknowledging him in all of our ways as Joseph did and as the example of the scriptures of Joseph's life are, then he will direct our path. No question. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. But God willing, wait and see. Joseph's later years in Egypt, study three coming up to a, not a cinema, a Bible class near you. Thank you.